Hey guys, what's up? It's Azure Soul back at it again with another story recap with my added thoughts on at the end. This is a follow up to my last Shogun video. If you haven't checked that one out, be sure to check that out um, as you might enjoy this one a bit more if you do. Now, without further ado, let's get right into it. The quest starts with us entering Inazuma City and wondering how the Yai Publishing House is doing. If they got any new books, yada yada. We then run into two numpties named Takatoshi and Kyoto, talking about wishing for Mora and wishing to pass some upcoming exams and stuff like that. And we ask what they're on about. And Takatoshi proceeds to tell us that there is a wishing ritual that is currently popular, which apparently actually grants the person their wish. Now we were skeptic, so he explains how he was as well until his mate, whom owed hella money to someone uh, and was a neat, wished for Mora and claims he woke up the next day with it when he found his friend dressed all proper and eating at a high class restaurant. He tells us to ask around if we still don't believe. So we do. We then run into these two numpties right here, whom you probably recognize from an Inazuma commission. They work for the AI publishing house. We find out that a lot of people have been talking about the ritual. Shigeru tells us Junkichi was actually trying it out as well, as he currently has writer's block, basically. And Junkichi claims his work for a lot of people. And we discover that the ritual itself comes from a light novel named A First Hand Guide to Summoning Spirits. And everyone who's had their wish granted has supposedly started acting strange. So we decided to go ask Yai about it because she knows more about spirits than us being a yokai herself. When we reach Miko at the shrine, we meet a man named Kato Yohei, who was pleading for her to help free his brother, Kato Shingo, from an quote unquote evil spirit because he has not been acting like his usual self lately. Miko, being the amazing troll she is, says it's nothing major and it seems like she it just basically seems like she can't be bothered to help this guy. It's <laughs> you gotta love her, man. You can't hate her. And we learn that his brother Shingo, the guy he's asking us to help, uh, requested to learn from Sensei Domon of the Meikyo Shisui Sword Art. If you remember, that is one of the characters who had his vision nicked by the Shogun back during the 2.0 quest line. So yeah, Shingo asks him to train him in this sword art and he basically turns him down and apparently tells him that he doesn't have what it takes. Shingo was hurt by this and ended up training hard as hell and recently defeated Domon's best disciple apparently. Now Yai, still not being too bothered, said that it's only natural after achieving this goal that he feels empty and lost. She recommends to leave him be for a few days. Yohei assures us that he is not acting like someone lost, which we then found out that the door had just happened only five days ago. So his attitude had changed completely for almost a week now. Yai seems to be lost in thought ever so slightly after he mentions that. And she proceeds to call him Kato, whatever your name was. <laughs> Yai lies to him and says that we are exorcists and that we're going to help him out. Of course, she's found a way to rob us into it by telling us that she knows that we're here to ask her a request as well. And by helping out this guy and doing this favor for her, she'll know if our request is in good faith or not. So she accompanies us as we head out to meet Shingo by Konda Village. When we get there, Shingo is gone. Apparently he has been meditating in this exact spot by Konda Village ever since the duel and been muttering and talking to himself. Yai sends Yohei to fetch some salt while we question the villagers about the two brothers. We find out that they hop between ideas and old debt collectors some money. Turns out Yohei and Shingo did want to start a dojo together and after bugging Domon enough, he did take him as an apprentice, but all he did was laze around and didn't take it seriously. Domon told him to piss off, basically, <laughs> and he took it personal and blamed Domon for not seeing his potential and swore he'd defeat one of his disciples in a duel. We talked to Kenji to verify the rumor of Shingo defeating an apprentice. Kenji himself went to watch the fight, so he's a good source of information. Supposedly, the way he handled his blade was like flowing water, and he was on a whole nother level, he was a whole nother person when he fought him. And when he defeated Domon's disciple, he said out loud upon his victory, what a duel. I haven't felt this good in a long time. We then find out he cut down three days worth of trees within the space of one afternoon, and then he kicked down a melon tree in just one kick as well. I mean, those are kind of small though, innit? So... Turns out he ran away when the village had brought in some gift tofu and he had no idea what it was. Yohei then comes calling out of nowhere and tells us that he has found his brother by the waterfall. We find Shingo meditating under a waterfall, just as his brother said, and it seems like he's been possessed. He's calling out for help and he's sitting and arguing with himself and he then notices us and walks over here and Yai pokes some more info out of Yohei, since it seems his brother is a bit resentful towards him. 
She told him she ain't stupid. She said, listen, mate, I'm not dumb. <laughs> I've clocked all the holes in your story because you waited five days to come and ask for my help. So you better tell me what the hell's going on. Yo, he spills the beans and it turns out they ended up doing the recent popular ritual that is in the guide to summoning spirits. I mean, oh no, plot twist, you know, like <laughs> who could have figured that out? And that way his brother ended up really good with a sword all of a sudden. And Yohei wanted to keep it under wraps at first because he didn't want him to lose his sword skills if they got the spirit exercise. So that, that way they could start up their school and pay off their debts. We throw salt at Shingo, literally, <laughs> which causes the spirit possessing him to come out and go after Yohei. Yohei shits himself and faints on the floor. So we end up fighting the spirit, which is named Arakawa Koji, and he really enjoyed the fight and disappears afterwards. Seems he was able to pass on completely content. He just wanted to fight, man. Yai tells the bros that Shingo would have died of fatigue if we didn't do anything. And if he did, then Yohei would have suffered the same price. She tells him to fix the fuck up and they promise to never do it again and fix their ways. But it turns out she lied. They would have been fine, but she wanted to teach them a lesson, which is just, oh, it's Yai, isn't it? Just, oh, she's so amazing. Man, I was, Yai simp right here, man. That, that's me. <laughs> um, but yeah, it turns out that that demon was an Oni that possessed him. And it also seems like he was trying to train Shingo, which is quite interesting. Um, and yeah, she just confirms that if they had gotten too weak, Shingo wouldn't have died. The spirit would have just left and Shingo would have just been sick for a while. Nothing crazy. But again, she had to scare him. So, you know, because she's Miko. That's what she does. Now that we've helped out Miko, we get to ask her our request, which is can she help us stop everyone from doing the ritual, especially now that we know how dangerous it can be. Um, but she says, don't worry. Anyone who does it will just get sick, maybe a little cold. And it will leave the whole spotty whenever they get too fatigued anyway. So it's nothing dangerous. And she doesn't give a fuck, basically, because it's nothing dangerous. So... <laughs> she says, no, let's get out of here. So we go to Dip and then Kuroda. Kuroda comes out of nowhere. He works for the publishing house and he comes out of nowhere to tell Yai their earnings. And he tells her that they're losing in all rankings, all rankings at the moment in terms of like books and stuff. And their profits are just shit due to the spirit guidebook. She loses it <laughs> and actually raises her voice for both of us to get back to her now. It was the first time she's raised her voice. It was like, oh shit, what the fuck? Um, she tells us that she's going to come up with a counter plan and we're going to help. We don't have a choice. And the reason we don't have a choice is because if we care about the safety of Inazuma's people, we need to help her out. Basically, she's twisted it, as she always does, because she's amazing. I love it. And she then claims we are going to war. We head to the Yai publishing house and Yai comes up with an idea to create Inazuma's newest hit novel and win their readers back. There is currently a writer's submission event going on. We go and talk to people to find out what is popular and report our findings to Yai at the Uyu restaurant with her team. She's now got a team of her editors and writers. Yai says we need to have a sense of realism in our work of fiction. She says it's all about information gaps and that we personally have our own experiences, so we'll just use them basically. So we sit down and tell Yai and her team of writers and editors about our adventures to help come up with a story summary. We then shortly suffer from writer's block ourselves before Yai offers to treat us to some food, which leads to the conversation about Mora, and then we remember the events of Liyue. After we get done telling Yai and the team about our adventures, we go to take a break while the Wiz kids get to work on the manuscript, and we go to the publishing house to request an endorsement from, quote unquote, Miss Hina. If you know, you know. And then we end up meeting Yai at the event, and Yai brings the manuscript and submits it with us under the pen name Thousand Hands. The sales numbers are to be announced for three days, so we turn the clock three days. We come back and we find out that our new novel is flying off the shelves and retailers are asking when more copies will be available to sell. We listen to the people around us at the submission event and they start talking about the spells in our book are more potent and safer than the other novel. We then move on to the next phase of the plan. Our next goal is to find the author of a first-hand guide to summoning spirits. But when Yai and the others confronted said author, aka the name Tomoyuki, he had no recollection of writing the book. Seems he was initially a failed author and begged for someone to help him write a good novel. He was then possessed by a spirit whom made him write the novel. We decide to go and summon the spirit ourselves and make sure he doesn't do it again. We're heading to a dungeon and find a weird painting. It seems a bit eerie. It's signed by Rakusai. Once we reach the end of the dungeon, the painting turns around to face a murky mirror which reflects an old era of Inazuma. 
and Yai claims that the painting is a swift summoning medium, so she'll be able to use it to summon him. We agree with her plan to be possessed by the spirit so that she can deal with it afterwards. But when we become possessed, we find out that this evil yokai spirit put the incantation in the spirit guidebook so that all yokai can terrorize the world and start a bloody war in Inazuma. Paimon shits herself <laughs> before Yai and the yokai she now calls Urakusai start bursting out laughing. She claims he hadn't changed a bit and caught on quite quickly. He agrees that he noticed what was going on due to the faces she was making and confirmed what we already knew about Yai and that she's a playful, trolley ass kitsune and that's absolutely why we love her. Well, I love her. She's waifu, okay? She's Inazuma waifu, okay? Back off, right. Just as Yai had surmised, Urakusai was walking around near the Sakura tree roots when he had heard the troubled author calling out for help and decided to write the novel for him. The reason he put in the incantation is because unlike him, when he was a powerful kitsune when he was alive, not all yokai spirits can possess people at will like him. So he decided to let other yokai have one last little joyride for something they loved. This in turn would teach people a lesson about not relying on their own abilities to overcome hardship. He likes the idea that humans, despite being born without powers, usually set out and achieve things. So in this way, he is doing them a favor. He also tells us that Miko, oh, oh Miko, I, I, just, I love this character guys. I, I, fuck, shit man, fuck. Right, anyway, he tells us she's actually one of the most powerful yokai and I'm just uh, like, come on, who, who didn't know that? Come on, man. Oh my God, she had to teach a God I had to put a consciousness into, come on, don't, don't, come on, just stop it, right? So anyway, Yai tells him that her book has outsold his own and we find out that she used to always pick quarrels with him back in the day when they'd meet with all their friends and gather and share stories. He finally admits defeat for once, which absolutely makes Yai's day centuries later. Before he heads back, he asks if they're going to have a hyakyako. She assures him arrangements are being made. He wants to stick around, but leaves our body to conserve his energy for the hyakyako. Urakusai is happy that Yai and A are doing much better. Before he leaves, Yai says he would have loved the current era that they live in and would have been her ace writer. We come back to our senses, having witnessed the full conversation while we were possessed. Yai asks us to help her with this one last request before parting ways. Paimon is upset and disagrees, but you know, one mention of a payment or more, and boom, she changed her tune. So we then head back to the shrine. But there we discover that the Hyakyako is a gathering of the yokai. Back in the day when they would gather and had enough to drink, they'd use their powers to fly so high, and there'd be so many of them that they'd block out the moon, which would create the moonless night. But the current memories that leak from the ley lines are weak and cannot fly. So Miko is going to perform a convocation ritual for them to help gather them atop the mountain into the sky and once their energy is spent, they will return to where they belong. We tell the Shrine Maidens to dip down the mountain so that they don't get possessed while this is happening and take care of the agitated monsters at the bottom of the mountain before heading back up to Miko and the ritual now begins. Yai seems to look sad after the ritual as she did just quietly say she was a little lonely seeing all her old friends leave. So we ask her if she's okay and she allows us to treat her to a meal. So the next day we head to Uyu restaurant. It seems peeps finally learn their lessons on incantations from fiction. We go inside and she absolutely trolls us by ordering the most expensive stuff, man. And she basically says we have plenty to pay for it because our books are still flying off the shelf. She basically played us as she always does. To, and that's basically how it ends. Um, the story if you talk actually you listen if you talk to her after as well after the cutscene's done the final one she says a actually told her off for messing with us as well while helping her sort out this fe the hyakyako is, is quite cool but um yeah that's basically how it ends uh it started out as one big troll but ended up becoming a serious ritual that yai did to help the ley lines and her friends pass on i personally really enjoyed the quest but I'm gonna enjoy anything with Yai in it, man. Like, if we're being honest, man, that's fucking Inazuma best girl. Don't at me. This is fact. No fiction, mate. But, <laughs> but yeah, I really enjoyed seeing a more serious side to her right at the end. And I really like the fact that just like some Japanese mythology and folklore, she is a playful kitsune as well as Urakasai as well. It's nice to see they got that little folklore going on there with their writing. Um, going off what I said in my last video though, it definitely feels like we are finished with Inazuma. I honestly have no idea what to expect from Ayato's quest in patch 2.6. I assume the chasm, 
will be the big thing in 2.6 since we saw the um the concept art in the last stream and his quest might just be one of them like eh, quests you know maybe one of them maybe not you know i'm just i'm just guessing it's just my sort of theories but you know you never know um i hope you guys are looking forward to it now that we have finished both story recaps though what did you guys think did you enjoy any of these story quests what are your hopes for the next 2.6 patch and onward let me know in the comments below and all jokes aside who is your inazuma best girl as always thanks for tuning in and i'll catch you guys next time be sure to thumbs up and sub if you enjoyed the video and have yourselves a good one.